Hey all, Jesse here. We're getting near the end of the year. I wanted to thank you for listening to Bullseye. Making our show isn't easy. We've got a very small staff that works tirelessly to book guests and edit interviews and keep things running smoothly. It is hard work that takes time, money, and effort. It's also incredibly rewarding. When I hear that a guest is an NPR listener already, it means a lot. And it means something to know that you're listening as well. So I'll get to the point. If you want to show your gratitude this holiday season, consider supporting the NPR member station in your area. Any amount. It's the single most effective way to keep shows like Bullseye going. It'll make a huge difference to public radio in your community. It makes a huge difference to us, too. To get started with your donation to an NPR member station, visit donate.npr.org slash bullseye. Or just text the word bullseye to the number 49648. We'll send you a text message with a link where you can find your local station and make your contribution. Message and data rates may apply. You can visit npr.org slash SMS terms for privacy and text message terms. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR. I'm Jesse Thorne. It's Bullseye. Alice Waters is the founder of the restaurant Chez Panisse in Berkeley. Chez Panisse is not a big place. On the menu, there are a lot of vegetables. Everything is seasonal. All of the ingredients are sourced from local farmers and producers. And if that sounds like, I don't know, basically every date night restaurant you've gone to in the last 15 years, just know Chez Panisse has been doing it for almost 50 When you read about the history of today's sustainable food movement, Alice Waters' name is one that comes up again and again and again and again. She's also a devoted, sometimes uncompromising advocate for changing the way we eat. She cares deeply about how we grow food, what our kids eat at school, and maybe most importantly, teaching kids how food is made. Anyway, I'm really excited to have her on the show. Let's get into my interview with Alice Waters. Alice Waters, I'm so happy to have you on Bullseye. Welcome to the show. Well, thank you. So I've read that you were a picky eater when you were a kid. What what are the things that you remember liking to eat? Liking to eat? That's a good question. I guess I really liked the tomatoes and the corn in the summer in New Jersey because they, well, I didn't know that the taste really was about growing them in our backyard, but I always wanted sliced tomatoes, corn on the cob, and then my father would cook a steak on the grill. (laughs) And um, I was very, very happy. What do you remember not liking? Pretty much everything I had for dinner. (laughs) (laughs) My mother wasn't very sadly wasn't a very good cook. And she'd never learned. And then all of a sudden she had this family and it was a lot of pressure to know what to do. And she relied on on frozen food and and you know, fish sticks and <laughs> the like. But she was determined to have us eat something that was healthy. Um, and so we didn't have desserts. We had fruit cup out of a can for dessert at night. And But the amazing thing was, back in the 50s, it was always good to eat as much butter and bacon. Those were healthy things for us. And so to cover up the taste of the sort of dry whole wheat bread... I could slather it with butter and put on a couple pieces of bacon. (laughs) And I made myself a bacon sandwich, which I loved. I mean, that's not half bad. I'd eat that. (laughs) Do you remember eating anything as a kid or maybe, let's say, as a teenager, given that you had picky tastes? I mean, like, I like to eat all kinds of things, and and I was the same way until until I was a teenager, probably. Um... I feel bad 
for my uh, mother and stepmother and father who had to cook for me. Um, but do you remember anything when you were really young that you ate that was a special thing? Well, I talked about it in my memoir, and I would always want to go to New York City and eat at the automat in New York because I could choose what I wanted to have. And at that time, there were people that were behind these little windows that you could see that were making, you know, a grilled cheese sandwich or an egg salad sandwich or just cutting into the lemon meringue pie. And I was fascinated by that and, and, and just felt like I had, you know, this special privilege to make that choice which seemed more important than really what it actually tasted like. I think having a sense, a feeling of control is a really important part of children's eating. I mean, I, I see it in my own kids. Well, I can say from 25 years now of the Edible Schoolyard Project in Berkeley, where we've been dealing with uh, a thousand middle school kids, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders, that when they are empowered to cook for themselves, they always want to eat it. And I mean anything. If they grow it and they cook it, they want to eat it. It's kind of amazing. You're seeing the whole process. And so it is that that I think is really transformational. Do you remember when it first occurred to you that you would like to learn to cook in a way that you had not had happen at home? I remember exactly that moment. <laughs> um, well, it was after a year of living in France when I was 19. You know, I was supposed to be going to school, but never attended classes. It was always about finding a restaurant, reading the menu, you know, tasting and tasting, you know, oysters right on the coast of Brittany and having them right out of the water. And it was a revelation. Do you remember what the first thing you tried to cook was that was a stretch for you? Well, I came back home, and I was luckily given an Elizabeth David cookbook. And so her recipes were were very straightforward. But I think the most challenging thing that I ever tried to cook was a pâté en croûte, this pâté that was wrapped in a kind of puff pastry and... It was seasoned at that time. I mean, I'd never seen black truffles, and they came in a little can, and I chopped them all up and put them in that pate. But when I accomplished that, I felt so, so proud, I guess. That's what I would say, and then I chose just the right wine to drink with it. <laughs> Did you make your own pastry and pate? I did. I can't believe I did that. I really don't believe I did that. No. One time when I was like 20, I had picked a bunch of apples from the tree in my mom's backyard and decided to make an apple pie out of them because there was just too many to eat. And um, I made the crust for the pie just by like opening, you know, I don't remember, the joy of cooking or something, <laughs> you know, like just some cookbook that was sitting around. And it came out really well. And... uh that was now probably 15 years ago. I have not attempted to make pastry since <laughs> just because I was so proud that I got it right that one time and I didn't want to break my streak. <laughs> yeah, I know how that is. Well, I've never made the pot de croot again, <laughs> ever. But it's something that you have to learn by doing. Why did you want to open a restaurant? I wanted to open a restaurant for my friends. I wanted to eat like the French. And truly, I, I was incredibly naive. I just thought, you know, somehow 
I could do this because I had eaten in these restaurants in France and I wanted it small enough and I only wanted one menu a night just like some of these little places in Paris. And I, I was frustrated that there wasn't a place where I could have those tastes. And I, instead of uh, cooking for my friends and kind of going broke doing it, I thought, well, I'll make a little restaurant and then my friends will come and pay for it. And, et voila. <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's a lovely thought to think uh, that in order to avoid going broke cooking, you should open a restaurant. <laughs> Which is the top the top way to go broke cooking. I know. <laughs> it we went, of course, I think forty thousand dollars in debt in the first six months. I didn't think about money at all. I still don't think about money. And I think I probably hired way too many people. <laughs> we had never had any experience except cooking at home. I mean, Lindsay, who was the pastry chef, I mean, she did the pastries sort of one by one or two by two in the kitchen, little cottage behind Chez Panisse to begin. I mean, she didn't know how to cook, you know, differently. And in a way, that could have been seen as the wrong way, but it turned out to be really the right way because we didn't want to have anything left over after the evening. We didn't want to have to use leftovers the next day. So we would know how many people came, and we would just start anew every day. That must have been intense. It was. <laughs> it was really intense when, when I burnt the corn soup one time. <laughs> And we had to tell people it was roasted corn soup. <laughs> <laughs> when when James Beard came to the restaurant, you know, he said, this isn't a real restaurant. This is like going into somebody's home. This is not a kind of, you know, production place. This is, This feels like you're going into somebody's house for dinner. And I thought that was the most wonderful compliment because that's exactly what I wanted people to feel. Did he say it in the way that you took it? Just about. I think he did. He wrote a column about it. When I was a kid, my family's shopped at a grocery store that's still in San Francisco called Rainbow Grocery, a natural food store. And the reason was not out of... Uh, some particular strong preference for, you know, natural foods over uh, processed foods or whatever, but mostly just because it was the only one within walking distance of our house and we didn't have a car. And I remember a lot of great things about that food, but I also remember like, you know, there's like a kind of Fig Newton that you get at the natural food store that where the outside is very intensely dense and difficult to chew. <laughs> the fig part's all right. Yes, I know about that. Sort of the health food. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I wondered I wonder what your relationship was having opened this restaurant in the Bay Area in the early 1970s as the idea of health food with a capital H and F was blossoming in, you know, the Bay Area and LA particularly. Well, you have to remember that I was a Francophile. And so even though I had, you know, digested many of, of the, the values of the kind of the hippie back to the land movement, and certainly diet for a small planet had a big influence on me, I didn't want that, what I thought was unsophisticated, you know, just throwing all the vegetables together and making some brown rice and serving them like that. 
I've wanted to go back into the history of of gastronomy. I wanted to learn from La Russe Gastronomique. I pored over that book and and wanted to know what Escoffier was thinking and I I really believed in the art of cooking and presentation. Over time, as you ran the restaurant, did you get any further from the idea of uh, French food, of Francophilia, and figure out what was good about either other, other foods of the world or simply American food? Absolutely. I feel like I had the good luck to learn from extraordinary people like Edna Lewis, and she opened up a whole world of Southern food to me. She was talking the same language as I was, but with a whole new vocabulary. And it was so uh, inspiring to me. I think of her one time wanting to go to a Southern Foodways conference, and she wanted to have milk and cream out there that was fresh, and she asked if she could bring a cow. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> she wanted to milk the cow. And that is what I'm, I'm looking for, is that the immediacy of uh, the the aliveness of food. More bullseye still to come after the break. From MaximumFun.org and NPR. This message comes from NPR sponsor, Smart Water. Smart Water is for the curious drinkers, the ones who are always looking for ways to make things a little bit better. That's why Smart Water created two new ways to hydrate. Smart Water Alkaline with 9 plus pH and Smart Water Antioxidant with added selenium. And now you can order Smart Water by saying, Alexa, order Smart Water. Smart Water. That's pretty smart. As the impeachment clock is ticking in the United States, Ukraine is in a race to fix a broken system before time runs out. It's just frightening because it's fast. A new look at the country on the other side of the impeachment scandal on Rough Translation from NPR. Hey, it's Jesse Thorne. We're very happy to announce that tickets for MaxFunCon 2020 will go on sale Friday, November 29th at 11 a.m. Pacific. I also want to let you know, this coming year, MaxFunCon 2020 will be our last MaxFunCon for the foreseeable future. For 2020 and beyond, we're going to be looking for ways to connect with more of you in person and spread the spirit of MaxFun farther than it's ever gone before. In the meantime, if you want to join us at the last MaxFunCon in Lake Arrowhead, June 12th through the 14th, you can find details at MaxFunCon.com. It's Bullseye. I'm Jesse Thorne. My guest, Alice Waters, is the chef and founder of the restaurant Chez Panisse. She's also an advocate for sustainability in agriculture and food consumption. My mom had a garden in the shared garden plot in the back of our church. The thing that I remember her growing there was uh, Easter egg radishes because, you know, radishes... Radishes aren't the most flavorful food on earth in the best of circumstances, and the and the flavor that they have is one that's not necessarily uh, the easiest to appreciate if you're seven years old. Um, there, you know, there's a pretty sharp flavor, but like, hey, if it's seven different colors, I'll eat it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the way it was. Uh- at the beginning of the restaurant, we put the word out that we wanted anything that was grown in people's backyards. We would make a trade for lunch at the restaurant. And I'm hoping that that's the kind of response that could happen and that we could really, you know, restart those victory gardens that we had back during World War II and thereby you know, learning the values the, of 
of nourishment and beauty and meaningful work and <laughs> all of those things we've lost in our fast food indoctrination. If you had like a uh, a half hour broadcast to all Americans, if you were, you know, if you got a, the slot after the State of the Union or whatever, <laughs> and you could teach people with no presumption of their cooking skill to cook something at home, what do you think would be a good thing uh, to teach those people to cook? Ooh, that's a very serious question. I think it's very hard to communicate through technology about food because it's about smelling and tasting. We need to be really in tune so that we can get all the information into our minds through our senses. And, I mean, the first thing that came to mind was pasta pesto. Because people in general in this country like that dish, and most all children do. And I would ask them to pound it with a mortar and a pestle, you know, with an inexpensive one, like a sarabachi, and pound the garlic and pound the, the basil in. And it's really just simply boiling the water for that. Maybe it's having a little good olive oil and a little Parmesan cheese. But it creates an aroma and a taste that can be unforgettable. I really love mangoes. <laughs> now, you must live in India, <laughs> or do you live in Mexico? Or maybe, maybe you live in Hawaii. I live in Southern California, where there are there are mangoes grown in Southern Arthur. California. Yeah, I think they're there at the Pasadena High School Farmers Market, and I'll, and I'll buy them when they're there. There's a few different varieties they make, but you know, um, there's a lot of Mexicans and Mexican Americans in my neighborhood who love mangoes, and um, you know, they'll sell those. Uh, what are they called? Atahualpa mangoes, the little yellow ones, um, by the crate on the side of the road and those are mexican mangoes generally sometimes philippine but, but generally mexican but i always want to know how they were produced i want to know whether they have herbicides and pesticides i want to know how they were shipped i want to know a lot of detail before i buy them on the side of the road is there anything that, like, it's February, you want to eat it, and you're like, sorry, Fairy Buildings far Farmer's Market, sorry, Berkeley Bowl, I'm headed to Safeway, <laughs> and I'm going to buy it in a can or off an airplane or whatever is necessary. Uh, no, I'm happy to report that I, I don't crave that. I mean, there was one very amusing story that my daughter, Fanny, uh, it tells in her new memoir that's coming out in the spring where she went to, she said she wanted blueberry pancakes. And I said, Fanny, there's, there's no blueberries. And I said, I, I'm sure you can't find them. And she went to, to the, the grocery store and she came back and there they were, a little label on, on the blueberries that said organic. And then she just had to tell me the truth. And she had taken a label off of another package. <laughs> and put it on. She sounds cool. <laughs> I once had the late Jonathan Gold on the show. And he's a really lovely guy and a real hero of Southern California food. He was a writer, for folks who don't know who he was, who was well-known for kind of expanding the palette of restaurant criticism here in Southern California. 
and he won every award there is. A wonderful writer and and a guy who would, you know, uh, putz around in his pickup truck and go to Reseda and eat, you know, some kind of highly herbal Southeast Asian blood sausage, and he'd get exactly what was good about it. And I, one of the things I asked him was, like, is there anything that you just don't like eating? Because he ate everything, you know. That was his whole deal. And he says, oh, yeah, I don't like eggs. <laughs> And I was like, you don't like eggs? <laughs> like, you're down for these. You're down to eat, you know, the the blood sausages, and you're 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 like, well, I'll knock a few balut back, you know. But he's like, uh, yeah, I just think eggs are gross, and uh, I like make them for my kids in the morning, and the whole time I think about how gross I think they are. <laughs> I guess he, I guess he hasn't had my egg cooked on a spoon. <laughs> But he's somebody I admire greatly, and he educated all of us. So I guess my question to you, Alice, is, you know, in your cooking, you strive to be seasonal, and that means having a relatively expansive palate because, you know, there's you, you can't just pick the six things you like and— uh, make those things when those things may or may not pass out of season or might not be good today. Um, so is there anything that you're just like, uh, that's gross? Not really. Not really. I, I'm very hesitant about, about seafood, about shellfish. And I, I guess I know too much, and sea uh, sea urchins scare me. <laughs> but I think that there's not very much that I wouldn't try. Climate change has been a huge issue in the food world in a thousand different ways. Has it directly affected the food that you make and serve at Chez Penny's? It has. Um, we are incredibly conscious of what's going on in the state of California as it's burning and as it's getting wrong, uh, warm at the wrong time of the year. Because when that happens, fruits ripen a little bit too quickly. And I think sometimes they need you know, enough time on the vine or on the branch so that they develop their full potential of taste. And we've known, noticed it in the stone fruits in the last couple of years. We notice that we get, you know, even strawberries um, sooner that aren't as flavorful. But it also turns out that our farmers are the ones that are very diverse in what they're growing, and they're, they have cover crops, and, and they're prepared in ways that, that certainly the industrial farmers are not prepared. I grew up lower middle class, sometimes borderline poor, and I grew up taking the subway to the farmer's market in the Civic Center in San Francisco with my mom to buy food. And my experience of farmer's market shopping was defined by, you know, being elbowed out of the way by elderly Vietnamese <laughs> women. Um, and, and I think that food was also cheaper than the food at the supermarket by my house. I haven't found a farmer's market like that here in Southern California where I live. And thinking about it made me wonder if you ever worry that the push to make food more local and seasonal to bring, you know, better tasting produce to people has been co-opted into being a a luxury product and that it's difficult for it, that it will be difficult for it to transition from being a luxury product into being a practical part of a broad swath of people's lives. 
I think you're right. It has been given that wrong impression by the fast food industry. They'd like us not to buy our food there at the farmer's market. It's too expensive. It takes too much time. So it really depends on our understanding of cooking, learning about what you need to spend money on and what you don't. But if we have a pantry that is well stocked, I can cook a meal in 10 minutes. And if we've gone to the farmer's market one time a week and we think about the sequence of meals, if we invite our family and friends to cook with us, we can make food that is that is deeply delicious and nutritious. Well, Alice Waters, I'm so grateful that you took all this time to be on Bullseye. It was... Uh... It was really fun. Well, <laughs> I'm so I'm so hopeful, and I so believe that this could be a, as I call it, a delicious revolution. Thank you. Alice Waters. Every day she's working to change the way we think about food. You can find out more about her Edible Schoolyard project at edibleschoolyard.org. That's the end of another episode of Bullseye. Bullseye produced at MaximumFun.org World Headquarters, overlooking MacArthur Park in beautiful Los Angeles, California, where we had rain and hail this week. You know, they say it never rains in Southern California, but... This week gave the lie to that claim. Uh, also, there was a lot of really intense thunder that freaked out the seagulls. The show is produced by Speaking Into Microphones. Our producer is Kevin Ferguson. Jesus Ambrosio is our associate producer. We get help from Casey O'Brien here in our office. Our production fellows are Jordan Cowling and Melissa Duenas. Our interstitial music is by Dan Wally, also known as DJW. If you like the music on our show, he made a collection of it on Bandcamp that you can pay what you want for. Uh, just search for DJW Bullseye on Bandcamp and, and you can grab it there. Our theme song is by The Go Team, thanks to them and their label Memphis Industries for letting us use it. Go Team Rule, you should buy their albums. And uh, one last thing, there are so many interviews in the Bullseye and Sound of Young America archives. Alice Waters and I talked about Jonathan Gold, for example. Jonathan was kind enough to come over to my house in Mount Washington, Los Angeles, when I still recorded this show at home. And uh, he was he was a true genius. He's gone now, but he, he was a true genius and a special dude and a wonderful interview subject. And we fought about burritos. And he told me that he hates eggs, but he still cooks them for his children. Anyway, you can find that at our website, MaximumFun.org. Uh, you can also find lots of past interviews on your podcast app. Just open up your podcast app. We're also on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. We post our interviews there as well. Just search for Bullseye with Jesse Thorne. And I think that's about it. Just remember, all great radio hosts have a signature sign-off. Bullseye with Jesse Thorne is a production of MaximumFun.org and is distributed by NPR.